Hi, Jerry. So you're uh, muted and videoed off, so you got to unmute yourself. I'm going to make you a co-host in just a second. So let's put this up here. And let's put this. I'm going to, let's see. Okay, I'm, I unmuted myself. Excellent. And I'll start um, the video myself. There we go. Whoa. I did that. Very nice. All right, I just made you a co-host. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the the uh, the recording, um, and I'll start it up again when we start. Sure. Hey, hello everyone. Hope everyone's uh, safe and healthy during this time of staying indoors. Um, Jerry, I'm going to interrupt really you for one more second. Jerry, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you for one more second. I apologize. Uh, I remembered yeah. as the as the screen came up. Uh, those of you who are are not familiar with how to manage your screen, I'm not sure that I can exactly tell you how to do it. But on the left hand side of your screen is most likely the image that Jerry is sharing of the ship and on the right side of your screen is images of the people involved in the call and so um, you have a couple of options between the images of the people and the image of the ship there's a, kind of like an invisible line if you put your cursor over that line you can hold it down and drag it and make one side of the screen larger or smaller depending upon whether you want to see more people or see more of the images. Um, on the top right-hand part of your screen, if you do speaker view, that means only the person who's speaking will be, will be shown, will be seen. Gallery view means you'll see just a couple of people and you can scroll through and see whoever else is on the call. But the, the main screen in general, uh, you have control over it uh, to, um, uh, to slide it back and forth. I, I, if you have technical uh, issues or questions, feel free to throw it into the chat. Uh, either I or someone who uh, who knows more than I may be able to help you. Uh, please forgive us if we can't. But at this point, back to Jerry. Hey, thanks, Rabbi. I, I noticed when I signed in to the uh, to this meeting, uh, at the bottom you had a question listed. When was your most recent trip to Antarctica? And I'm curious, did anyone else reply that they had been to Antarctica? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess well, they, they may have actually. Didn't. I'm going to get to everybody look at the registration answers. Oh, okay. Well, as most of you know, um, photography is my, my hobby. And I got it, a notion in my head that I would like to go to Antarctica to, to make some photographs. And uh, the stage where I'm at with my photography is I, I really enjoy taking photographs of the graphic elements of scenes, uh, shapes, textures, colors, patterns, uh, those types of things. So many of my photographs tend to be on the abstract side um, but I hope that they do convey a, a sense of what it was really like to be there. And what did I do when I, uh, how did I prepare for a trip to Antarctica? Well, I called some photographer friends who had been there, and it seems like once a photographer has been to Antarctica, uh, they keep returning, they go back for, for more of that experience. And so I got some pointers on uh, what kind of gear would be useful and, and how to prepare. And getting into Antarctica, there, there are usually um, weight limits on how much you can bring on, on the airplanes. So I had to plan ahead uh, for what I would bring uh, along with me. So I was able to decide on, on cameras. I took two, two uh, cameras and, and three lenses with me and a duffel bag full of clothing. The, the, I was there in December 2018, and as you know, uh, that is summertime 
for Antarctica. And the average daytime temperature is between two and four degrees C uh, Celsius, which is just above freezing, not, not too bad. So if you have a few layers of clothing, you're okay. The main consideration in planning is to have uh, layers like a thermal underwear uh, underneath a waterproof set of trousers and jacket because riding on, on a Zodiac to get to land, uh, there's a lot of spray you could get wet. Um, so once we're, we're once we get to Antarctica, we're, we're on a boat, and, and this is the boat, the ship that we were on for 19 days, and it's called the Polar Pioneer. And I uh, went on this tour with a group called um, Aurora Expeditions. It's a Canadian company. Most of the passengers were Canadian, uh, and there were a few Brits and and a few Americans. Uh, the ship is a Russian, uh, what they called a Russian research vessel, which I guess is code for uh, a former spy vessel. Uh, the captain and all the crew were, were Russian, and, and the staff were Russian. There were 54 photographers, 54 passengers on the boat. It was primarily for photographers and photography, as oriented that way. There were a few people on the boat who were kayakers, but if you signed up for kayaking, you were committed. Twice a day, you're on the kayak, on the water, uh, and there, when you're on a kayak, especially a, a single person kayak, it, it's difficult to paddle and, and take photographs at the same time. So uh, I was in definitely the photographer's group. Um, the other thing I did to prepare was I, I viewed documentaries on, uh, on uh, Netflix uh, about Antarctica. And there was one, it's called Tales by Light. It, and the, uh, there's a, a session called Panorama. And it's the, the star of this show is Peter Eastway. He's a photographer from uh, Australia. And it's it's photograph. It's a documentary of his adventures in Antarctica on this particular ship. So beforehand, I got to see the ship and how it was laid out and how the the, the berths were laid out. And in fact, um, I should say the ship was not. It was comfortable. It was very comfortable. It was not luxurious, uh, which is just fine for me. I would rather spend the money to be out there a couple more days than. Um, and to have a little more luxury on the boat. Uh, the, the food was, was fine. They kept us well fed, three meals a day, plus fresh fruit for snacks if you wanted. So it was really uh, quite a comfortable, um, quite a comfortable trip. Now uh, I should say this Peter Eastway, from, he's well known in, in Australia, uh, just like uh, someone in, in the US if you've heard of Rick Salmon and, and other explorers of light from Canon. Um, he, so a lot of the people knew who he was and I was a little taken aback that uh, he really, he made a statement about somebody who we know in, in America, Ansel Adams, famous landscape photographer. And, and this, this fellow actually had the temerity to, to say that he thought Ansel Adams was boring, but I didn't hold that against him. So let's talk about Antarctica. I usually get a question, how big is Antarctica? This map shows uh, Antarctica, the continent uh, with respect to the uh, United States. Essentially, it's the same land mass as the US and Mexico combined. Uh, it's on the south end of the earth, the South Pole opposite from the North Pole. Um, for example, you will not find polar bears and or walruses, which you find on the North Pole. They, they don't exist on the South Pole. Uh, but the South Pole has penguins, and you won't find penguins on the North Pole in the Arctic. Um, also, the, the South, the South uh, Antarctica is a landmass, unlike the North Pole. And where we went in the I don't know if you can see the pointer here. Where we went is along the Antarctic Peninsula. There's this piece sticking out here. 
and Antarctica is defined several different ways. Um, there's something called the Antarctic Convergence, which is the, the cold water flowing northward from the Antarctic continent, where it meets the warmer water flowing southward, and the two waters meet, they, they meet, and then they flow downward, and they circulate downward. And the water temperature changes, the salinity changes, uh, the, the seabirds and everything that you see, the, the marine life changes. So the Antarctic convergence, which isn't constant, it changes from year to year, but that's one definition of Antarctica. Another definition is 60 degrees south latitude, where it's generally accepted when you're, when you're below 60 degrees south, you are in Antarctica. Um, Another definition, 63 degrees south latitude generally circulate, um, circumvents, circumnavigates the entire, includes the entire landmass, except for portions of the peninsula. And the, the last definition is the Antarctic polar circle, which occurs about 60, 63, uh, I'm sorry, 66 and a half degrees south latitude. Now on our trip, we reached 64 degrees, 50 minutes south. And this is the map of, of our voyage. This, this trip that I was on included a trip to South Georgia. And then uh, a moment we sailed to the uh, peninsula and spent another five days uh, on the, exploring the Antarctic Peninsula. Now you first have to get there. So we flew into Santiago, Chile, spent a couple of days and, and the passengers were congregated at Santiago. We took a, a plane to Punta Arenas in, in Chile. And from there, we took another flight to the Falkland Islands, Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands where we boarded our ship. And we took two days, a two day sail to South Georgia Island. And when we passed Shag Rocks, uh, we knew we were getting close. And then we explored the North Coast of South Georgia Island about five days, and then uh, motored to, uh, uh, where did we stop at? Elephant Island and then the, the peninsula. And this is, you can see we crossed the Scotia Sea to get to South Georgia, the Weddell Sea to get to Antarctica, and we crossed the, the famous Drake Passage uh, to get back to, uh, ultimately our destination was Ushuaia, Argentina. And these seas, the, the Scotia Sea, the Weddell Sea, and all the other seas around Antarctica are collectively known as the Southern Ocean. And here we, we end up in, uh, in, in the Falklands Island, Port Stanley in the Falklands. Just by the phone booth, you can see this is a, a British uh, protectorate. And you, you might remember uh, in 1982, the Falklands War, when Argentina wanted to take possession of the territory, uh, that war is still very much on the minds of both Argentina and, and uh, the UK in, in the Falklands. And this is a photograph of Port Stanley, a very pretty, pretty town uh, in, in the mountains, right on the sea. And there were some people outside a, a local bar Having, after work, having their, their, their beer. And they were very friendly. And they told me a little bit about life in Port Stanley. And in fact, they worked for the, the UK, the British government. And there are still people who are employed to search and destroy landmines dating from the 1982 Falklands War. And inside this bar, in fact, they have uh, displays of, of weapons and paraphernalia uh, used in the Falklands War. So like I said, it's very much on their, their minds still. And here's uh, on, on the waterfront, these guns are not uh, historical displays. Those are uh, ready for active use. Okay, Antarctica. Here's a map of showing the circulation of the water and the wind patterns pretty much follow the same clockwise rotation around the Antarctic continent. 
And one of the reasons why the Drake Passage has, is uh, notorious for the, the rough uh, seas is that the passage narrows and all the water, all the, whole, all the circulation around has to pass through this narrow passageway and that makes for very rough travel conditions at times. Uh, it's collo colloquially known as either the, the, the Drake Shake or the Drake Lake. And uh, well, for better or worse, we got the shake, the Drake Shake when we crossed back. And you'll notice this is, this is um, the Falkland Islands and here's South Georgia Island. And then you can see we're, we're pretty much following the current to get to South Georgia. And then we're going across, we're going well, actually against the current to get to Antarctica and then cross current to get back to South America. So on our two day vo uh, sail or voyage to South Georgia, we had time to practice our a panning technique. So we would stand on the deck and watch the seabirds who, who were following us and, uh, and take pictures. This is a Cape Petrel. Uh, very, very beautiful bird. This is a, uh, a black-browed albatross and they live most of their lives uh, sailing over the ocean uh, looking for food. And, and this is a southern giant petrel. And so we occupied our time uh, attending lectures. They gave, there were lectures on, on safety and environmental awareness uh, and, and photography and the history of, of South Georgia Island. Now, South Georgia Island is, is very particular about who they allow onto the island and, and about the precautions they have to take to avoid uh, bringing foreign animal and plant material onto the island. South Georgia had a problem with, uh, with a rat population and wild reindeer. Uh, South Georgia was used as a whaling station for many years. And the, the sailors, well, the rats would come off the ships and, uh, and uh, find homes uh, on the island. And the reindeer, they would just let go and they would uh, become uh, wild herds of reindeer, which they could uh, be harvested by, by the people for meat at any time. Well, the, the rats were eating the bird eggs and reducing the bird populations and the, the reindeer were, were a nuisance in other ways, I guess. And so there was a program of eradication of the, the rats and the, uh, and the reindeer. And, and now the focus, and that was successful. And now the focus is on foreign plant materials. So before we were allowed on South Georgia, we actually had to take all our gear and take a vacuum cleaner and, and vacuum all the little plant, you know, grass seeds and plant seeds that might be in our, our backpacks and, and external clothing. And I didn't realize my backpack has a, a mesh back. And sometimes I lay that on the ground and I don't think about it, but I look in there, there's all kinds of this little plant material. Well, we had to use uh, uh, paper clips and a vacuum cleaner to get out all of that stuff and, uh, and pass an inspection before we could, we were allowed to, to land on South Georgia. And we knew we were getting close. This was our first iceberg uh, as we were approaching South Georgia. And it was very exciting and just the, the and the color is this is true to the color that that we saw as we, we approached it was sort of late evening um, obviously being summertime we had very long days and in fact uh, by the end of the voyage we had about two hours of, uh, of darkness which was really not darkness it was more like twilight so about 22 hours of daylight and then a close-up of these uh, these cracks and crags in, in the uh, in the iceberg. You can almost feel them coming apart. And then we came across the uh, shag rocks, which you saw on the map. This told us we were getting close. These are rocks sticking out of the ocean, seemingly uh, in the middle of nowhere. You could see nothing else around it except these rocks sticking up. But we knew we were close. Now, 
in this map, they, they kept it, they drew a map and kept us informed on, on where we were on the island at all times. So th this was our route along the North shore of um, the Falkland Islands. And you can see they call it Falkland Islands Dependency, very much a British uh, dependency. And this was our first anchorage uh, at Elsahole Elsa Bay. And it, it looks like it's uh, just a bit choppy, but actually it was more than choppy. It, it was uh, uh, rough enough that we, we couldn't land. Uh, we couldn't land the kayaks. The only way to get off the boat is by, uh, by Zodiac or kayak. And the Zodiacs hold 10, 10 passengers plus a driver. Um, you can see the, the waves actually were they're pretty good sized waves. The other thing that kept us offshore on, on this voyage or prevented us from going on shore was the, uh, the fur seals. And I guess it's a good thing the fur seal population has really uh, rebounded and come back from uh, almost extinction. But uh, the, the fur seals uh, crowded the beaches and they get at this time of year, which is uh, late spring, early summer, um, are very territorial. What had happened is the, uh, the females had given birth to the pups, they had nursed the pups, and then they had uh, left. They had gone out to sea to, to recuperate and the pups were left sort of on their own to figure out how to feed themselves. And the, the male fur seals, their job was to, um, to take claim to these various spots on the beach. That would be their spot. If they had a prime spot, that would give them a better uh, chance of uh, attracting a mate. So this is taken from a zodiac. The first penguins that we saw uh, were, were macaroni penguins. And they have these delightful little little uh, orange feathers off, off, off their head. They have the red beaks, orange feathers. And uh, they're, they're, I don't know, you can't see it in this photograph, but uh, their feet are, are like claws. So they, they're great climbers. And how great a climber are they? Well, you see that it's gray in this mountain. They're not, it's not rocks. Those are penguins. And they climb up there every day to their nest and then they, they waddle down, they climb down to the water to, to feed and to, to get washed off and then they climb all the way back. So they're tremendous climbers. Now here's another uh, set of penguins. These are Gen 2 penguins. They're distinguished. They have the red beaks, but they have the, the white flash on their heads and the orange feet. Those are Gen 2s. And you can see this is a mixed colony. You have your your fur seals in the back, and looks like there's even a little elephant, elephant seal adolescent in the back. And this is a third kind of penguin. This is a king penguin. And again, you've got your, uh, your fur seals and then your elephant seals. Now here's a, a fur seal guarding his territory. And uh, they, they do get uh, quite, quite territorial and, and they will attack if you get too close. And so they, they told us how to protect ourselves from, from fur seals. And one of the techniques was to, to stand up and raise your arms and uh, talk to them. And, and sometimes they would back down. And then the other technique was to carry a walking stick. And if they charged you, to tap them on the nose. You, not, you don't have to hit them very hard. You tap them on the nose and they get so startled because they don't expect it, they, they back off. So I thought I had it figured out, you know, because I had tried to make myself large technique and, and that worked for a few times. But then I, I encountered one first CEO who just wasn't buying it at all. And he kept coming. And I didn't have a walking stick, but fortunately my roommate who was next to me had one. I called him over and said, you know, bring that stick over here. I need it. And uh, so we, uh, we, sw we thwarted that one. Now, one of the uh, lectures that we had on the way over there 
was a safety lecture by the ship's doctor. And that ship's doctor uh, had to be competent in, in just any type of medicine, any type of emergency that might come up. And he described uh, and showed us a video from that occurred on the tour, two, two tours before hours, two voyages before hours, same ship, where a photographer was sitting down, taking a picture of, of seals, and there was an elephant seal behind him, and he wasn't watching his back. And that elephant seal ran up to him, grabbed him by the buttocks, tossed him in the air, and he fell down, and then he repeated that, grabbed, threw him up in the air a second. The guy almost died. Um, fortunately, he didn't hit any, any arteries or anything. Uh, and the ship's doctor was able to patch the guy up. Uh, but the, the point is, watch your back. And if something happens, uh, the whole voyage stops or turns around. Uh, so, you know, your carelessness could impact the whole, the whole ship uh, and the experience for the other passengers. So, um, you know, and there was a video of this whole thing because there were, he was on the beach with other photographers. So, it, all this was documented, and uh, and the and the passenger who got injured gave his permission to share it with other passengers, just as a, a cautionary tale. So we were we were very careful. So again, uh, mixed colony, a fur seal, uh, an adolescent, and then some elephant seal adolescents behind. Okay, now here we are. Uh, at Salisbury Plain, I think this was our second or third anchorage, and this was a colony uh, in the ship's log. They they say this colony has seventy or seven thousand uh, breeding pairs. That doesn't include the the babies. So the, these are king penguins and the brown furry little guys. These are king penguin chicks, and they are all uh, pretty much molting. Even the adults molt every year just to keep their feathers uh, in good shape. And molting, it doesn't look like a very pleasant experience for many of them. Uh, here's a picture of a, a group of king penguin chicks. This was taken with, with backlight. I was facing the ocean, the sun was in back, kind of highlighting the, uh, the fur around them. And, and I, in order to get the, uh, the bright highlights, I had to lower I lowered the exposure to, uh, to emphasize the, the bright rim lighting. Okay, this is what it looks like when a penguin is molting. And almost done molting. And this guy, I had to say, I, I really liked this, this guy. Uh, and I, I sort of thought this was like leader of the pack, you know, like, like, like the old uh, DA haircuts that the greasers used to have in the 50s. Um, but I, I, I recently thought that, you know, this might be um, a stay at home hairdo now that we have to stay at home without haircuts. And it looks like I'm close. I'm using a, a basically a long telephoto lens. The rule here is that you need to leave at least five meters or 15 feet between you and the wildlife, the seals, penguins, birds, whatever. Uh, if they come closer than that to you, it's okay. So I, I was not uh, within, I was further than five feet from this, from this penguin. Okay, and then this is a typical scene on a beach, a volcanic black sand beach uh, with mountains and a glacier coming down from the mountain. Uh, a mixed population, fur seals, King penguins and some elephant elephant seals here sparring in in the background. Okay, there's a close up of a fur seal, and these long whiskers are, are sensitive, and they allow it, it, it's like echolocation, I guess. That they allow the seal to uh, follow their prey underwater. I guess they can feel the vibrations or something. Okay, I thought I was prepared for this trip, but this passenger came really prepared. 
and he actually showed up on the beach like this, you know, in his uh, uh, tuxedo and everything. And he's maintaining his, uh, actually the, the penguin came closer to him. So he, he's okay in terms of that isolation distance. And you might notice he is wearing boots. They, they issued these, uh, these rubber boots because we, we had to jump off the, the zodiacs into the water at the shoreline. You, there might be a foot or in some cases two feet of water. So you really had to have the, the boots to prevent your feet from getting all soaked. Okay, the, here, this is a pair of elephant seal pups. They're, they were called, they were referred to as weaners because they were in the process of being weaned. The mothers had left them uh, to fend for themselves. Uh, and they were kind of talking to each other saying, are you my mother? Where's my mother? And when I was on the beach, what I was looking for were, were gestures. It's just anything interesting to show the animals uh, interacting with each other. And here, another pup, this one's a little older. It's got some fur developing. You can see the reflection of another one of our passengers in the eye. And these two uh, wieners are learning how to spar with each other. And here's a yogi, yogi seal doing a sun salute on, on the beach. Uh, I was really taken by the, uh, the texture of the, the skin on, on the back, the folds of the skin. And here's a, a, an elephant seal pup uh, just making a gesture at a, a, a skewer. The, this is a, a southern skewer and uh, was, was not in any danger of being harmed. And then there's elephant seal. Um, and the seal that, that was in the video hurting the, uh, the one passenger um, was about this size. So basically we were very cautious whenever we uh, saw these elephant seals around. They were just surprisingly agile and fast. They can, they can sprint for short distances. And they can also climb. This is up, up in the hills. You can see the, these are elephant seals taking in the sun in, just in the mountains. You know, it looks like a, like a sound of music backdrop here with the elephant seals. And then we've got, of course, macaroni penguins. And I wondered myself, and I've been asked the question, well, how did macaroni penguins uh, get their name? And in fact, I looked it up. And in fact, um, there's a connection between the, the Yankee Doodle song. Yankee Doodle came to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. In fact, that is the origin of the name of, of this penguin. And it starts from uh, his 18th century England. The fashionable young men uh, would, would uh, wear wigs and dress foppishly. And some of them would travel to uh, Italy, where they would develop a taste for pasta. And when they came back, they were called the Macaroni Club. Uh, and then to fast forward during the Revolutionary War, the British soldiers would make fun of the, the uneducated American buffoons. Um, they call them Yankees. Yankee Doodle, a doodle was a, uh, a, a dunce or, or not, not bright person. And if you're riding on a pony, certainly instead of a horse, you know, you know that, that shows that they're not too, uh, too educated. Uh, and, and also they stuck a feather in their cap, they called it macaroni, they, they can't even imitate uh, the, the, the style of, of the Englishman. And then later, about a decade after that, some British explorers saw the, these penguins and they named them macaroni penguins for the bright yellow feathers in the, in the head. Again, more, more, more penguins uh, showing they, how they definitely can, can climb. And, so, and we're still on South Georgia Island. This, this is the uh, Grit Viken Whaling Station. It's not active, it's, in, it's a museum, 
now, and it has gone through various iterations. Early on, uh, they used to bring the whales in and take off the blubber and process it into oil, and then throw away the carcass, you know, the, the skin, the meat, the bones, all that, they just throw it into the bay. They made a terrible mess. And then at some point they were required to utilize the, the skin, the meat and the bones, and they would process those uh, primarily for uh, uh, animal feed. And then later when whaling was, uh, was outlawed, uh, it became a, a museum. Is one of the one of the whaling ships, and the ports along the side are where they would they would harpoon the whale, and they would connect it through one of these ports on the side of the ship, and then bring it in. Once once they had all the ports filled with whales, um, they would connected with whales. They would come in and uh, and process the whales. Now this is uh we climbed up on hills. We could. Get, a, get an overlook of, of grit picking. And you can see that these are the old tanks where they would store the, uh, the whale oil. That was the, the dormitory. And here they have actually a hydro plant where they, have, they had a, a reservoir and they could take the water and generate electricity and, and electricity and water. And then they have their own uh, little graveyard. And in this graveyard is buried uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton, uh, a famous uh, British explorer. Actually, he's Irish, but uh, he was doing this for the, for the British. And I'll talk more about him later. And there's another view, even, even the church. Uh, and th there's a post office here. You can send a postcard from Grit Picken, which I did. Um, I, I sent a postcard home and it took four months and three days for the postcard to arrive. So it was a long time. Okay, so another anchorage, uh, it was a, this was Ocean Harbor. This is the, the Bayard. It was a supply ship and it was blown from its moorings in a storm and grounded and just never uh, freed. And, and basically has now become a uh, a habitat for birds. This is another whaling station uh, at Deception Island. Deception Island is, is a caldera of an active volcano. The side of the caldera is collapsed to the point where you can actually sail a ship from the ocean into the center of the caldera where they had this uh, whaling station. And in the 1960s, the volcano became active again and they uh, uh, they destroyed the station, and they didn't they didn't uh, renew it. They didn't resume activities there. So at this point, we're off to uh, to explore Antarctica. So again, like I said, we're we're sailing we're sailing into the waves, into the current uh, to get to the Antarctic Peninsula. And this gives you an idea of some of the waves we, we ran into. And this was our first tabular iceberg. And then we uh, arrived at Elephant Island. Now, Elephant Island is significant. There's a monument to Sir uh, Ernest Shackleton because his ship, the Endurance, uh, was part of uh, the British uh, exploration of, of Antarctica and his ship became frozen in ice. Uh, actually three times they were able to dis dislodge it twice and the third time it got stuck. They overwintered on the ship on the frozen ice. In the springtime the, the ship started to break up as the ice shifted. They, they moved the, the men, the 28 men on the ship moved onto the ice and then uh, two months later the ship actually broke up and sank. So there they, are. there they were, the men with the three lifeboats and their supplies, and they went across the ice to open water. And, uh, and they ended up uh, 
landing on Elephant Island. This is where they landed, uh, 28 men and three lifeboats. And they, they knew they needed to go for help. So Ernest Shackleton and five other men took one of the lifeboats and left the other men and the lifeboats here and they ended up going to South Georgia Island. They uh, landed on the south shore of South Georgia Island, had to cross by land over the mountains to get to a whaling station. And it took four months and three attempts before they were successfully to come back to Elephant Island to rescue the men. And the important thing is that all the men were rescued, not one man perished, one man perished uh, in this operation. And so uh, Ernest Shackleton is known as, as a, a captain you really want on your side. Okay, this was another image taken to Elephant Island. Okay, this is a, a little uh, thing that I, that I found. For scientific discovery, give me Scott, speed and efficiency of travel, Edmondson, but when disaster strikes and all hope is gone, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. So it was a well-loved captain. Okay, this is what the, um, the Zodiacs looked like. Five passengers on a side and plus the, the driver. And you see we're all dressed in our outer clothing, life jackets. Uh, the, the driver actually has a dry suit on. He's ready to go full in if he has to. But uh, I found that photographing from a Zodiac is, is um, difficult for several reasons. First of all, the Zodiac is moving. You have waves. You have erratic movement. The, the, the driver may turn the, the, the Zodiac at, at any time. And then you've got other people on the, on the Zodiac, which could get into your frame. So, so this is what happens. I set my camera, the next, uh, six frames have to do with photography. Um, I, I wanted a, a really sharp image, right? So I set a, a low ISO of 100, uh, a very small aperture so I get uh, a sharp image front to back. And what my camera did, since I had a very small aperture, uh, my camera said, well, you're not giving me much light through this little aperture. so." Um, I'm going to have to stay open longer, so it gave me one twelfth of a second, and this is what happens. Now, one twelfth of a second may seem pretty quick, but in photography, it's slow, and this is what happens to your image. Also, you take note of this hat of one of my fellow passengers. So, what I did was change the f number. I opened opened up the aperture about four stops. I increased the ISO by two hundred by another stop. Uh, and my shutter speed became one ISO or a one one hundredth of a second. And for most handheld photography on land, that's more than adequate. That should be okay. But on a Zodiac, it's not. And if you notice, we have the same the same hat in the frame here. So then playing around with different settings, I uh, increased the aperture even more, increased the ISO even more. And I'm coming up with 126 hundredth of a second, which that's starting to look more like what I wanted. So I, that's I'm, I'm dialing them in, I'm dialing it in. That's what I need. And then I'm trying to change it. I, I just open. I, I close down the aperture a little bit more. And because the scene was bright, my camera only gave me one four thousandth of a second. So really, it's a you know, the shutter speed you get with this technique. Uh, is, is a function of the brightness of the scene you're looking at. So that's when I switched the shutter priority where I fix the shutter speed and, and, I, and the ISO and I let the camera tell me what kind of aperture I need. So these are another type of penguin. This is a chin strap penguin. This is the fourth type of penguin. And uh, these, these guys are headed uh, to the water for a bath and followed by another macaroni penguin. And so again, one, one two thousand ISO one hundred ISO or uh, f number seven point one. So you get nice, uh, nice focus front to back. And this is a glacier at uh, Elephant Island. 
Okay, now we came across some tabular icebergs. This is tabular iceberg. It has a name. They know it. It's called B09F, and the B stands for the quadrant where it was, was birthed. Uh, 09 is the order of discovery, and F is the fragment in alphabetical order. So this is the ninth, or the, I'm sorry, the sixth fragment to come off of uh, tabular iceberg B09. It's 300 feet tall, 100 meters tall. And I'm, just, I'm, on the, I'm on the ship, I'm using a long lens, so it, it looks closer than it really was. If you get closer, you just endless variety of really wonderful patterns and shapes in, in the ice. And one time I was fortunate enough to capture some calving of ice off of the uh, iceberg. In fact, you can see remnants of, there, there's a wave here in the front. That wave was from the first calving, which I heard and saw, but I wasn't ready with the camera. But I was, for the second one, I was, I was ready. Okay, there's just wonderful scenery. Um, people ask me to describe Antarctica in a word, and, and my word for Antarctica is sublime. And sublime in the sense, not in the sense of um, beautiful and peaceful, uh, not at all. Sublime in the sense of awesome, powerful, terrible, uh, and uh, something that in, inspires fear, actually, because it, there, there are a set of rules here. And if you don't know the rules or if you don't follow the rules, um, you, you will die. Uh, so sublime in that sense. Okay, it's some ice forming on top of a mountain. And it, it, in this image, it, it's a glacier coming down from the mountains. And you see, you have the wonderful layers. You have the water, the, uh, the black glacial rock, the glacier, and then uh, another part of the, the, the rock on the mountain behind it. So I just, I just love the, the, the layers in this image. Again, you have this, this dark volcanic rock, these mountains. So this is a, uh, the, the remains of a wooden boat. This, it's actually an historical artifact. You're not allowed to touch it or go inside of it. It's a, a wooden supply ship that would bring water to a research station. And this is in a place called Half Moon Bay. Um, and there's plenty of wildlife. You see these chin strap penguins uh, going out for, for a bath or a swim. We did see, uh -huh, this is a, uh, What kind of whale was that? Humpback, humpback, yeah. It's a humpback whale fluke. And we did see see other other whales as well. This is a a crab eater seal on, on a piece of ice. And the crab eater seal is misnamed. It actually eats krill. Um, and its teeth are shaped in a, in a way to strain out the water and strain out the krill. Uh, the tiny shrimp uh, from the water. And we spent uh, just a wonderful morning at uh, Paradise Bay cruising in, in very calm water. It's snowing uh, among the glaciers. And these glaciers were brought endless opportunities um, for seeing shapes. You could see d different interesting shapes. I don't know what you see in here, but I see a couple of hooded figures, you know, maybe a, maybe a bird. But, but the variety of, of shapes was wonderful here. You, show, you see the, the striations from, from, uh, from melting, uh, causing these vertical, uh, vertical marks. 
And here's one. Um, looks like somebody wearing a mod a mod hat. And, and these different uh, layers are formed when when the iceberg uh, center of gravity changes, the icebergs rotate and it starts melting in different places. So you get these wonderful shelves and patterns on, on the iceberg. There's a couple icebergs. I, I think you can tell which direction the wind is coming from. And the light is uh, whatever, it, it's whatever is available. And, and the frequently uh, there were uh, heavy overcast clouds. And every once in a while there'd be an opening in the cloud that would bring a spot of light just perfectly on, a, uh, on an iceberg. And that was one, that's, that's what this moment was. And we saw some orcas. Uh, they were hunting Gentoo penguins, actually. We know that because we saw the school of penguins fleeing in front of, in front of the orcas. So here they are spy hopping, looking for those, those delicious little Gentoo penguins. Here we were going by. I, I was watching this, this Gentoo penguin. It was hopping around the iceberg and then it was, it was on its way down. And, and then it, 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 it lost its footing. And you can tell it's a Gen 2 by the, the, the white flash on its head. And there it goes, plop, in the water. And uh, the Gen 2s weren't the only uh, animals who, who went diving into the water. Some, some of our passengers were, went diving in the water and took the polar plunge. I did not do that. I can tell you these people went directly from the water to the onboard sauna uh, to warm up again, but, but they had a good time. You can see that definitely there, <laughs> there's ice floating in that water. Okay, just uh, wonderful opportunities for uh, dramatic landscapes. Again. Jerry. Jerry, yeah. While you're uh, while you're uh, scrolling through, someone asked a question about um, uh, global warming and animals up there. Uh, there seem to be a lot. Is that is that because there really are a lot, or is that has has been affected, and we're looking at what's left, or do you know anything about that? I I can address that. I can address that. Um, the, the captain, not the captain, the guide on our ship uh, pointed out, we, we went up a, uh, a narrow uh, a bay and at the end of the bay, there was a large glacier. And we were told, again, I didn't see pictures and I don't have any point of reference that the glacier used to extend much further out into this bay than what we were looking at and pointed to that as evidence of global warming. Um, also, uh, you'll see later, I'll show you another type of penguin, an Adelie penguin, uh, which is uh, acclimated to cold climates, colder climates than, than say, the Gentoo penguins. And as a result of warming, the Gentoos, which like warmer climates, have started going further south into the Adelie's um, territory, nesting sites. And so now what we saw were nests where Gentoo and uh, Adelie penguins were sharing nesting sites side by side in the same location. And that was told, um, described to us as evidence of uh, a general climate shift, uh, which is causing the, the Gentoos to move further south into the Adelie's uh, territory. Again, this, this is an example of just a, a spot of light moving over, over the scene and capturing it just at, at the moment when, when it caught my eye. <clears throat> this is Nico Harbor. As you can see, the further south we get, there's more and more uh, ice and snow. It's colder and colder. You can see uh, our, our dedicated kayakers out there exploring. 
and we have Gen 2 penguins uh, growing, moving up and down from their nesting site to the water. And they have these penguin highways where they, they peck down these little trails or highways and we're, we're prohibited from walking on these or destroying these because the, the consequence could be that uh, if, if our footprints destroy this, this smooth little highway that they have, it causes them to expend more energy to get around it or over it. And in, in times of, uh, you know, low food supplies, you know, that could be the difference between life and death for the penguins. It could have, it could have severe consequences. So we were very careful not to destroy or interfere with their, uh, with their nesting sites or their, uh, their highways. Okay, here's two uh, Gen 2 penguins meeting each other on the highway. And, my, and I was interested to see what the rules of the road were, you know, which, which one has the uh, passing right away. Actually, it's the, uh, the downhill penguin had the right away. The, the, the fellow in the uphill direction stepped aside and let, let the other one pass. So this is the little harbor, uh, Nico Harbor. There's a, a glacier coming into the harbor. Just, I, I could almost feel the movement of, of this glacier breaking apart, even though it was, it was stationary, obviously, at the time. And here's uh, two Gen 2 penguins and, and the one bringing a rock onto the nest. Rocks are very important. The nests are all built on rocks, uh, not because they're comfortable, but because they're well-drained. Um, and they're warmer, uh, so rocks are rocks are like uh, currency. So, uh, and this this pebble was probably stolen from another nest. Uh, so there was uh, some thievery going around. Actually, someone did a a study. They they put colored rocks on different uh, penguin nests, and they watched how the colors kind of redistributed themselves among the, the nesting sites. So they. Uh, definitely, there was some stealing and restealing uh, going on. And of course, there was the celebration of the new pebble on the nest, and then the, uh, the call and response. You know, they periodically would also one one penguin would start to call, and and others would join in. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't uh, I can't reproduce that sound. And then here's a, a chinstrap penguin. Again, Nico Harbor, and uh, I think chin straps are just the coolest, the coolest of the penguins. Okay, this is Port Lockroy, called also called the Penguin Post Office. As you can see from the flag, this is also a British post office. That's the southernmost post office in the world. Um, I also sent a postcard from this post office, and coincidentally. Um, it also took four months and three days to arrive home. Okay, it's a view from the post office to our waiting ship. It was uh, actively snowing. They have, they have a population of Gentoos at the post office. And even on in the walkway going up to the post office, uh, they have crosswalks, penguin crossings, and they're very serious Penguins have the right of way. If there are penguins coming by, you, you let them go and you wait. And then here we are crossing the channel, making our way back uh, northward. Uh, one more stop, Peterman Island. Actually, this was, this was the furthest south that we got. And what you see here isn't a deli penguin, no, no white flash on the head. Uh, and the, the beak is not red. There, there's a Gen 2, Gen, same one, same nesting site. You can see that two eggs there. And uh, Adelis like the colder climates, Gen 2s like the warmer climates, and so the Gen 2s are now uh, apparently moving southward as evidence of some global uh, impact. Yeah, you have it. Just wonderful conditions for photographing penguins. There's another uh, Adali. 
that we were following the lead of, of a Gentoo penguin. And then now we're heading back uh, through the pack ice to, uh, to the Drake Channel, the Drake Passage. Okay. And on the way, uh, we, we encountered a lot of uh, seal, different seals. Uh, in this case, uh, crab eater seals on the ice flows. And you might notice is the, the scars on the side of, of the seals. Those are from leopard seal attacks. Leopard seals eat crab eater seals. Uh, these two got away. This one got away. Apparently those attacks are fairly common. And then here we are going across the Drake Passage. It was quite, uh, quite bumpy. Uh, the, the worst part for me uh, about, the, about the waves, I, I, I did not get seasick. But I tell you, the, the ship had a uh, uh, autopilot navigation system. So if a wave pushed the, the ship in a, in a different direction from its uh, uh, assigned course, uh, a rudder would kick in and move it very quickly back to the right direction. And you know, you'd be walking down uh, the hallway and all of a sudden, man, the ship would turn 40, 50 degrees and uh, that, that would throw you off. And uh, I guess the, the only real mishap I had <clears throat> was in the shower of, of our cabin. Uh, the bathrooms basically contained the shower, the sink, and the toilet all in one little room a drain in the center of the, the room. Um, and in the middle of the night, I was up going to the bathroom and the ship decided to make one of its quick turns. And I fell against the, the handle of the shower, turned it on and, and sprayed myself. Um, but So that was the only, only mishap that I had with, uh, with the waves. So then we ended up in Ushaya, Ushuaia, um, Argentina. Uh, there's the Beagle Channel. Uh, we, we took, I and one of the other passengers hired a guide to take us to Tierra del Fuego National Park. And we had a nice view of the Beagle Channel. And across the, on the other side of Beagle Channel is Chile. And in, at, in Ushuaia, they have a, uh, a museum, a number of museums. It used to be a prison, but now that they have a maritime museum, a prison museum, art galleries, a historic museum, you know, history of Ushuaia, and an Antarctic museum. And so it, it's built, it, I don't know if you recognize the design, this is exactly the design of Eastern State Penitentiary in uh, Pennsylvania. And I think if, if Philadelphia really wanted to do something nice with, with Eastern State, um, they could think about doing something like this, because this, this is a really nice museum. Okay, so that, that's my uh, great Antarctic adventure. And, that, and this is me on Peterman Island. I, I was, it was a snowstorm. I was focused on, on some Adelie penguins with a, with a chick. I was hoping that the, the mother would move uh, enough that I could see the chick and it, it didn't happen, but um, ended up getting covered in snow nonetheless. So thank you for, for letting me share and relive the memories of, of this trip. It was, it was a trip of a lifetime. That's great. If people have questions, feel free to raise your hand um, and I'll call on you. I know that uh, uh, someone pointed out in the chat, Ralph pointed out that Antarctica is the only place uh, that doesn't have the pandemic, actually. So I wonder if uh, if they're not doing any trips at this point, uh, or uh, or maybe they're. Uh, well, Rabbi, I can answer that. They are doing trips, but the visitors, when they first come in, the first thing they have to do is a 14-day quarantine. Interesting. Very and interesting. After 14 days, then they're allowed to. Sure. And the question that was asked earlier about the about global warming, um, one of the things that they were interested in knowing is specifically about the animals. Is there has there been effect? I know the icebergs are shrinking and things like that, but um, has that affected the animal life? 
or would you know? The only thing that was mentioned was that this in South Georgia, which is a little further north, that uh, the fur seal population and the bird population are thriving and increasing. And, and that's primarily due to um, conservation measures uh, that are in place. And then, like I said, they do have very strict environmental regulations and, and you really have to take all kinds of precautions before they even allow you onto the zodiac and onto the, the land. Do you have a sense of uh, how many people uh, visit uh, each year? And if so, uh, you know, how often or, you know, is there a time where people don't go or, or, or no. hurt? Well, when they don't go is the winter time, meaning our summertime. Uh, where they do go, when they do go, it, it's, it's winter time here, summertime there. So um, November through, through maybe March, that's sort of pushing it, uh, would be the time to, to visit. I don't know numbers, but I can recommend that if you really want a good experience to find a small ship, don't, don't book one of the larger, you know, 300 passenger cruise ship, you know, and I know 300 doesn't sound large for a cruise ship, but it is down there. And, and what you're up against in a large ship is they they only allow 100 passengers on shore at any one time. So if you have 300 passengers, only one third of the boat's passengers can go ashore at any one time. So you're waiting for other passengers to come back so that wow. you can go. So in our case, we have 54 passengers. So we had no waiting and we, we could, uh, we could load up and, and be off the ship in 15 minutes. Wow. All right. So I'm, I'm, I launched a, a, some polling. There are a couple of questions. If you see where it says polls at the bottom, you can answer some questions. And while you're, while you're checking that out, uh, uh, Frank had a question. I'm not sure if I asked it for you or not, but Frank, you're unmuted. So feel free to ask a question if you have another one. Yeah, I basically, you, I think you answered the question, Jerry, the, the, how many weeks and how many tours go each year. So obviously you can only go, uh, I mean, our, our wintertime is our summertime, our summertime is our wintertime. Yeah. I've seen stories and I've seen some videos uh, where they've had I, actual icebreakers have to go down there to uh, rescue people that got stranded down there because the winter down there came a little sooner than they had expected uh, because you, you're applying cold waters that are very cold. I could see from a lot of the pictures that you had, the amount of ice uh, that was in the water at the time that you went. Uh, I've been to Alaska and I remember we went to, uh, we were supposed to go into Hubbard Glacier. Uh, this was in July and they had some, uh, they had a little bit of ice in there, but the, uh, it was the temperature got so warm that the actual glacier, Hubbard Glacier was starting to, I wouldn't say melt, but you know, fall apart. And the captain on our ship was only limited to how far he could go in because of the danger of the ice and the propellers on the ship we were on. So it's, sure. it's dangerous going, regardless of when you go, it's gotta be dangerous when you're going with uh, the waters and the ice and everything else that's, that's there. Exactly. Um. We had a, I'm sorry, we had another question about, um, about preparing the presentation. Um, how long did it take you to, uh, to figure out which pictures to use and about how how what percentage of pictures did you not use? Because I'm sure that was probably larger than oh, the ones they got. <laughs> well, I'm still figuring out which photographs to use, and in this photo in this presentation, there were photographs that were not in the first presentation. Um, what you saw was uh, about 110 images. Um, I came back with after three weeks. Uh, I came back with 12,000 images. So you can calculate the percentage from that. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, there's a, like I said, there's a, there are some poll questions on there for people to answer if they want to, uh, about, uh, would you, would you go with Jerry if you were to go back? And, uh, um, if he, if he, uh, decide, if he decides to share his, uh, um, his safari, his African safari adventure, when, when would you like to see it? And then the other question is, where should Jerry go next? <laughs> oh, I've got an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I gave my a couple answer, of. Uh, I give a couple. My answer of, is my next, my next uh, 
excursion will be to uh, photograph the aurora borealis. Ah. The only question is, you know, from where? You know, Alaska, Canada, Iceland. Um, so again, I've got photographer friends who've been there and, and have given me some advice. That's great. We'll, we'll see. I thought you were going to say your next excursion would be to the supermarket. That's every two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A, a week from, uh, yeah, next Monday is, is I'm due for another supermarket trip. <laughs> That's great. Personally, I would vote for Seattle sometime sooner than uh, the Aurora, <laughs> but I don't know when I'm going anywhere ever. Well, the question wasn't where should Lois go next. The right. <laughs> so the question was where should Jerry go next. We, right. the whole, we could have asked that question, but it was a different, whole different question. <laughs> Actually, there, there, was, there is a connection between the Africa trip and the Antarctica trip, because when I first thought of Antarctica, I, I called the the fellow who ran the Africa trip. Uh, and I said, do you know anybody going to Antarctica? He said, well, I don't, but one of the guys who went on one of my African safaris, uh, one of the same ones I had been on uh, at a different time, uh, had, is planning to go. And he did the research and he looked at the ships and he found a, a ship uh, with a small number of passengers, photography oriented, um, and it seemed perfect. So I, and he lived, the, the guy lives in Allentown. So I got in touch with him and we communicated and, uh, and we coordinated our, our travels um, to, to Chile and Antarctica and back. Huh, that's great. Uh, yeah, once you know someone who knows something, then, you know, I know not everybody's able to get to the poll questions. And I, I know on mine, it just says like along the bottom of your screen, it says mute, stop video, participants, and poll is one of the one of the options there next to reactions. Um, or it could be if it's if there's too many things at the end, it should say more with a couple with an ellipse uh, right above it, three dots above it, and yeah. it might be there. I don't know, but um, well, what I not, see, yeah, forty percent would go take me in a heartbeat, and sixty percent would be tempted, but likely not. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Are there other are there poll questions here that I'm not seeing? Yeah, there are, there are, there are three questions. Um, the second one. I'm not sure how to. Uh, there you go. Uh, oops. There we go. Um, then there's the. Uh, oh, maybe it's. Do they, are they timed? I don't know. Maybe they're timed. I, I can't, uh, I can't figure this out. Anyway. Oh, here's Safari. Would you register to see the African Safari? I recommend the African Safari too. I've seen it many times and I still love seeing it. And third, okay, next adventure. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, people are um, saying some, giving, giving some great comments. I'll, I'll send you, you know, you'll get a copy of the chat also. Uh, that'll be recorded. This whole session, the recording will be uh, posted in the archives folder. And so uh, um, getting some people who saw your Africa presentation asking for that again. Mark and Rhonda, I want to see Africa again. Okay. And um, yeah, uh, but like uh, all the all these positive comments, really people appreciating the uh, the sharing of your trip and and uh, really just uh, great praise for uh, for being brave enough to go in the first place. <laughs> Amazing, unusual, wonderful, um, all these uh, great, fascinating, fantastic, all these great uh, adjectives. Well, I can recommend if, if you're interested to see more and specifically to see about this particular ship uh, on Netflix, a series called Tales by Light Panorama is the series or is the episode. Peter Eastway uh, is narrating um, his adventure on the Polar Pioneer. Of, of and what was that called again? Tales by Light. Tales by Light. And the, 
that it's a series and the episode is Panorama. Okay, I'm just putting it in the chat. And the other thing I did that really helped when preparing for this uh, uh, adventure was I, I borrowed uh, DVDs from Mark Hager on Ernest Shackleton. And uh, that, that really, you know, a, a trip to Antarctica is not complete without understanding who Ernest Shackleton was and, and what he did. Uh, it, it was really uh, quite something to, to sort of almost walk in his footsteps. Hmm. Uh, the other thing you need to do uh, before you go on a trip like this, I needed to go to my family doctor and get a signed certification uh, that I was in good health and, and I was uh, able to jump in and out of a Zodiac on my own power. Huh. They wanted my, my body mass index. They wanted to know if I had any heart issues. Because again, it, if, if someone has health issues while they're on the voyage and they're serious, the whole boat has to turn around. So they, they take that quite seriously. So they can't just ship you home? <clears throat> well, actually, uh, they might be able to because uh, we had free access to the bridge of the boat. Um, all they said was, you know, don't push any buttons. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't steer the boat. <laughs> and so um, they had uh, a screen where they could see all, all the ships, all the icebergs uh, on the map. They could see if there were any ships nearby. And on occasion, uh, once or twice, uh, there were other ships on the radar. And, and they could point out, okay, they knew what the ship was. They talked to the captains. And to, in order to enhance the experience, they, the ships coordinate who goes into what bay. Not, not more than one ship in, in each particular bay at any one time. And so if, if there's a, a cruise ship in a location where we're scheduled to be, the captain gets real upset and says, you know, what are you doing in our spot, you know? And, and, uh, so th they do coordinate like that, just to, uh, to lessen the in encountering of, of other ships. Excellent. So uh, Mark and Rhonda just made a comment about how uh, they remember when we, uh, when, when we, when you came back from Israel, because you went without me, and, uh, and you shared some photos during uh, a Shabbat evening service. There was a little Israel trip reunion. And, oh, yeah. uh, and so there was a request for, uh, for the Israel trip show. Oh, that could be done. Definitely. Jerry's actually been on three Israel trips altogether. Well, actually, um, two, I, two days after I came back from the Antarctica trip, I joined a temple trip to, uh, to Israel. And so here I was <clears throat> talking about glaciers and smelling of penguin, uh, finding myself in Tel Aviv, Israel. And it was quite, quite an experience. Like, where am I? juxtaposition of, yeah. of, of atmosphere and uh, climate and all sorts of things. And, and speaking of which, some, some people talk about the, the odor in the penguin colonies. I, I didn't find it to be very objectionable. objectionable. It, it was not that strong. And if anyone's ever been on a, a farm, a dairy farm, uh, that, that's certainly more pungent than what you would encounter <laughs> in a penguin county colony. Right. I woke up to the, the smell of the dairy farm uh, every morning when I lived on kibbutz in Israel during college. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. It's a comforting smell for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I have an aunt who likes the smell of skunk. For her, that just... Now, that's crossing some kind that's of line. I don't know. strange. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so, Jerry, thank you so much. And... Um, while we'll end the official presentation, you're at this point welcome, you know, just like we do with own eggs and stuff, you can unmute yourselves. As long as we're connected, you're welcome to uh, interact with each other. But um, uh, just, uh, Jerry, thank you so much. It's really just been wonderful and, and how great of you to share. And uh, we'll talk about maybe the Israel trip or the African safari or, you know, who knows what. And uh, we'll, we'll see. Maybe we'll get you back on. 
So at this okay, point, I'd be glad to. Hi, Lynn and Steve. I'm glad to see you. That was glad great. We were so glad to be here. Glad you joined us. Loved it. Great pictures, Jerry. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Lynn. Lynn. Lynn and Steve are in Seattle, for those who, who may not know. And Lynn and I have known each other since we were in eighth grade. Just for a little orientation. So it's great to see you guys. Take good care of her boy. Yeah. <laughs> we're trying. Yeah. From a distance, but we're trying. <laughs> yeah. A shorter distance than uh, than Lois and Jerry, but still a distance. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. We were able to have them over to dinner for Shabbat before it all locked down. So that okay. was and Lynn, Lynn and Steve were the ones who uh, put together the Seder that, right. that we participated in. I hope you're acclimating yourselves well in uh, the, the new coast. You know which way the ocean is. We managed to buy a house in the middle of all this. So <laughs> it was, like, it's just a more and more unusual time. But we're glad to be near our son and yes. daughter-in-law and baby. So. That was lovely, though. We're so glad we could be here, there, Great. anywhere. Yeah. Good. Irene, I'm glad to see you. You managed to get on. You're muted. <laughs> you are. There we go. You're fine. Oh, I just... <laughs> Let me see participants. Yeah, she muted. There we go. She's muted again. There we go. Yeah, she's not talking. No, yeah. she actually turned it off. I'm trying to unmute her, and it's not unmuting. Right. I tried to unmute her. I think your your microphone is actually off somehow. I think you actually turned it off, Irene. There you go. Okay. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, those, those DVDs of uh, yeah. Shackleton's Adventures. Yeah, yeah. Really, really primed the pump. You know, they really. Oh, it, yeah. It, it, it was a, um, a mini series um, that I think was uh, produced by AMC, one, one of the networks. Um, about the voyage where um i'm trying to remember who, who played shackleton was um oh I, do you remember who was uh, kenneth kevin uh, Ke kenneth, kenneth Brano. Brano. and he just did such a great job uh, it's it's a really wonderful miniseries i think the dvds included that yeah, the DVDs had the miniseries and some documentaries. Okay, the, well. story, the story was told a few times you know, yeah, in the DVD, yeah. so it was good. Yeah, but I, I love the drama because I think that uh, Brownell was just so good in it. Um, but, it, it, you know, if, if, if anybody wants to borrow it from me, uh, you know, let me know. Uh, and uh, in some the, in the future, in the future someday, <laughs> or or we can do like pick up or something. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about, Mark? Oh, I have uh, DVDs of uh, uh, a mini series plus some documentaries about uh, Shackleton. Oh, the uh, the the fact that he managed to not only save himself but save everybody is just so amazing because uh, when he left that uh, uh, the other crew behind and went uh, on a little boat trying to get to that whaling station, you know, he, he's navigating with almost no equipment through very difficult seas. And if he misses by a tiny fraction of a degree, they die because there's nothing else there. He, he the, they either rode to the whaling station or, or they don't. Right. Plus the seas are, are not as calm as they seem. Jerry was pointing out in that one picture um, that, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing. Where you, were you were showing me how it looked, it, the sea looked calm, but you pointed out there was a zodiac that was hidden yeah. by one of the yeah. waves. Right. The height of the waves, yeah. 
And then when they got to the island uh, where the whaling station was, going overland across that island was very, very difficult. It took them 36 hours without stopping to walk over the mountain and down. Yeah. The, and it, that crossing had never been done before. Right, right. And, and, and his companions were, you know, they're totally exhausted and he realized that they had to keep going. So he would say, okay, uh, go ahead and sleep for a few hours. And then he'd, he'd wake them up a few minutes later and say, <laughs> uh, yeah, you got a few hours of sleep, let's go. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> right. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the activities that was on the brochure was walking in Shackleton's footsteps from the, uh, the whaling station where he got help up, up to the mountain. And one of the activities was to be able to make that trek. Wow. Or at least part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was canceled because there were too many fur seals in the way. Uh -huh. the, the, the island or the, the shore was crowded with fur seals, which yeah. is a good thing. But, uh, and they, especially this time of, that time of year, uh, they were very aggressive, waiting for the females to come back. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing that uh, no, no one, uh, it's, it's interesting because no, no one in the polls, so no one said not a chance. There were a couple of uh, absolutely, and then there were uh, a few mm -hmm. tempted, but might likely not, but no one said no right away. So Well, that's because Mark answered it. <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda, you, you and I can go to Longwood Gardens or something while the guys do their thing. Send me a postcard from there. <laughs> You'll get it four months and three days later, but, okay. it'll, but it'll arrive. Actually, three months and four days, but no difference. <laughs> you must have been so excited when it came in the mail. Yeah. Did you, if you remember, like, I was in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> And that's wild that from both from both of the post offices. It was the exact same amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> that's just, just to illustrate how rigorous and dangerous this trip is. When Jerry was buying travel insurance, they said, Oh, you need like this enhanced something something um, insurance. And then when they found out he was 67, they said, Oh, we don't even sell that type of policy to somebody <laughs> your age. Because they don't expect anybody that age to be able to even do it. Wow. Because it's it's very rigorous trip. Yeah, that's uh, what, what how was how old was the youngest? How old was the oldest person? Do you know? I think the youngest they were maybe uh mid to late twenties. Mm -hmm. And she was the that person the what's that? Was it the guy in the tuxedo? Who was the, the guy in the tuxedo? Oh, he, he might have been 30. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine you had, you know, limited, a weight limit on what you can carry, and the guy used up part of it for right. the tuxedo. Oh, that's worth every ounce. That's the picture. That's, <laughs> that's totally the picture. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to imagine people that young having enough money because this was a very expensive trip. But how old was the oldest, do you know? Or have any idea? Probably mid 70s. Wow. Well, we had, I told you, uh, Joshua Sukunik and Mary Beth, you know that. They uh, they honeymooned in Antarctica. Oh. In I did their wedding. I did their wedding in the Poconos outdoor I, in February. The, oh, I've been following uh, little Caleb and his progress. And then, then they honeymooned in, honeymooned in Antarctica. Right. They had their baby, little boy? Yes. Yes, Caleb is like um, nine days old now. Oh, wonderful. And uh, he's still in the hospital. He was quite small and there were some possible issues and he still needs to gain some weight and learn how to regulate his body temperature, but he's making good progress. Oh, wonderful news. Yeah. And they chose the name because Caleb was one of the scouts who said, yes, we can do this. 
<laughs> well, his father is Joshua, right? Right. Joshua's right. the other one, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice. yeah. <laughs> That's neat. Your, you know, your postcard took uh, four days to get to to Philadelphia, and then three <laughs> to make it to your house. <laughs> 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 or vice versa, who knows? <laughs> well, you don't know mind. That the ship that I was on was part of the, the mail service because we took from the from the uh, Port Lockroy post office, we took on board their bag of mail and delivered it to somebody. My uh, my mother's father during World War II, he, he spent his whole professional career working in the post office. He was the personal assistant to like the assistant postmaster in New York City or something along those lines. He had some kind of, you know, high level administrative position. But um, during World War II, he was one of uh, several people who were involved in ensuring that all of the military mail got to the troops wherever they were. So he was one of the few people who actually knew where all the troops were during the course of World War II because he, uh, he was involved in, uh, in that. Um, I actually have a whole a whole collection of plate blocks that I, like I'm looking for some uh, philatelist to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to help me figure out if it's worth anything. But um, yeah. if you know anybody who who knows stamps, I'm looking for a referral. But yeah, but he was uh, he was involved in the in getting the troops their mail during World War II. One one of the places that I'm uh, kind of interested in, and I'll, I'll I'll never go there is. Uh, Tristan da Cunha, which is a, an island in the South Atlantic, it's they they claim to be the most remote place on Earth, and I, I tend to believe it. Um, they're they're like you know thousand miles from anywhere. They're British. Uh, yeah, British. Yeah, and uh, they have occasionally a mail ship that'll come in and give them mail, and you know I remember one year. Uh, the seas were kind of rough, so people didn't get their Christmas presents until February. <laughs> Happens. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Yeah. What's you know what the population is? Um, I'm trying to remember, it was like thirty some odd families, but I don't remember how many people altogether. Some odder than others. Yeah. <laughs> You used to follow their newsletter, right? The yeah. Newspaper. Well, they had an elect for a while. They don't. It's a shame they don't have it anymore. Somebody had a uh, an electronic newsletter, which, which is kind of interesting because uh, there wasn't. They didn't have internet access at the time the newsletter started, but uh, somehow they managed to work it out. And it, and it was neat reading the you know following the news the newspaper because. You know, if somebody was born or, or somebody had a big birthday party or so, you know, it was, you know, that's front page news. So were most of the people there working for the government, kind of like on the Falkland Islands? No. Um, so the biggest industry was uh, postage stamps. And, uh, and then there was also quite a bit of uh, fishing it was, it was also. It says, I just found a, a CNN travel article from January 31st of this year. And it says, um, very briefly, it says it's, it's 1,750 miles from South Africa. The British island group of Tristan da Cunha uh, stands profoundly alone in the South Atlantic. The nearest landfall is South Africa, 750 miles east. And to the west, South America is more than 2,000 miles. It's the world's most remote inhabited island chain, so, precar so precariously occupied that when a volcanic vent erupted in 1961, the whole population was evacuated to England. <laughs> <laughs> and then to quote the website, there are no package tours for independent travelers, no hotels, no airport, no holiday reps, no nightclubs, no restaurants, no jet skis, nor safe sea swimming. All visitors need to clear their arrivals in advance through the Island Council, and they also need to obtain a police certificate a 40-day wait is typical. Ten sailings a year from Cape Town and Namibia, each taking five to six days to reach the island. It costs $800 to $1,500 for a round trip. 
it, it, it's, it's a different place. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, I, unlike Antarctica, the, there are people there, live there, you know, their whole lives there. 246 British citizens. 246, yeah, but they're, they're really just from, you know, like I say, a, a, real, a small number of families. Yeah. Wow. I, I was really inspired by the museum in Ushuaia. That looked was, neat. You know, exactly the same design as Eastern State. We went with the central hub with the with the cell blocks radiating from the from mm -hmm. the center. And it would really be nice to see uh, Philadelphia do something like that, as opposed to having one Halloween horror show a year, you know, that kind of thing. They don't have tour. You can't take tours there. You can take tours, yeah. But you know, it's just a, a few of the cells, like Al Capone's cell, is sort of made up. But all the others are still in their um, decrepit state. Interesting. But I don't know. Maybe I'll send an email suggesting. Yeah. Thanks again, okay. Jerry. Thank, Thank you so you. much. You're welcome. It's really nice to, to relive uh, some memories there. See you, Irene. See you, Rabbi. Yes. Thank you as well. We'll see some of you uh, tomorrow, uh, Delta Dead, Wednesday yeah. night. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Bye bye. What did I read that said it was going on tonight at 8 o'clock or something? Oh, yeah. What 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 is tonight, Irene? I don't know. I read that there was something going on at seven or eight o'clock that we should all make sure we go to, but it was too fast for me to get what it really I was. I think it was the adult dead tomorrow night at seven o'clock. Oh, it could be. What is it? The Sharon uh, Formentals. Uh, I think it's I some uh, it on the lesser known people. In the um in the, in the Bible. Bible, she did one last week, and she's gonna do oh, one that's one okay, yeah. Tomorrow night, it was very interesting. So, okay, bye bye. 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 Take care. Thank you.